Good day my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible refers to what we think of as the tribulation. There's the false prophet, and then there's the antichrist. They are not the same people. Take him out of here, and God indeed would protect all those who hear this false message that comes from her lips. Pope Francis has uncovered the truth about the antichrist, and it's nothing like what we expected. The idea that the Antichrist may not be an individual at all, but rather something far beyond our expectations, is coming to light. The shocking revelation of the 87-year-old Pope has caused many believers around the world to fall into fear, seeking shelter beside God. What did he reveal? Could the leader of over a billion Catholics, the man seen as a figure of hope, compassion and unity, actually be hiding something far more sinister. Today, we'll explore a claim so shocking about the Antichrist, a future world leader who will persecute Christians and is expected to bring chaos to the world. But before we dive in, here's a question for you to see how much you understand about your belief. Is it according to the Bible? What is one of the characteristics of the Antichrist? A he will promote peace and unity among nations. B. He will claim to be the true Messiah sent by God. C. He will deceive many with false signs and wonders. D. He will lead people to repentance and righteousness. The countdown is on. Have you got your answer? It's not that hard, right? We can't wait to see your answers in the comments section. We'll come back later to solve this question. Now, let's find the key to open the door to the truth about the Antichrist. You know. Is the Pope, or perhaps the next Pope, the Antichrist? It may sound confusing, but there are many speculations about the identity of the Antichrist, the uniquely evil end times world leader. One of the most frequent victims of this speculation is the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. In the days of the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther and some other reformers were convinced that the Pope of that time was the Antichrist. Popes John Paul II and Benedict XVI were commonly identified as the Antichrist. The current Pope, Francis, will likely be an equally popular target. Why is this? Is there anything in the Bible that would indicate that a Pope will be the Antichrist? The speculation about the Pope possibly being the Antichrist revolves primarily around Revelation 17-9, describing the evil end time system symbolized by a woman riding a beast Revelation 17 to 9 declares, This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. In ancient times, the city of Rome was known as the city on seven hills because seven prominent hills surround the city. So, the thinking goes, we can know that it is somehow connected with Rome. If the evil end time system is somehow associated with Rome, it does not take much thought to see a potential connection with the Roman Catholic Church, which is centered in Rome. Numerous passages in the Bible describe an Antichrist who will lead the Antichrist movement in the end times, Daniel 9, 2 Thessalonians 2-3-4, Revelation 13-5-8. So, if the end times evil world system is centered in Rome and led by an individual, the Pope is a likely candidate. However, many Bible commentators say the woman cannot be the Catholic Church and the seven hills cannot refer to Rome. They cite the fact that Revelation 17-8 clearly identifies the woman riding the beast as the city of Babylon. The ancient city of Babylon was located near modern-day Baghdad. In addition, verse 10 plainly states that the seven hills symbolize seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is and one is to come. Whoever the Antichrist turns out to be, the important thing is to be warned of his coming and to learn to recognize him and all who possess his spirit. 1 John 4 2 3 tells us how to identify the spirit of Antichrist. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Is the Black Pope the Antichrist? The idea of the Black Pope stirs curiosity and sometimes fear. 
among both conspiracy theorists and those within the Catholic Church. But who exactly is the Black Pope? And what role does he play in the grand scheme of Catholicism and in these theories about Pope Francis and the Antichrist? To start with, the term Black Pope doesn't refer to some shadowy figure lurking in the background, plotting against the world. In reality, the Black Pope is a nickname given to the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, more commonly known as the Jesuits. The leader of this influential order of priests is called the Black Pope because of the power and influence he holds, and because he traditionally wears a simple black cassock, in contrast to the whites worn by the actual Pope. This title has been sensationalized over the centuries. Some claim that the Black Pope wields more power than the Pope himself, orchestrating events behind the scenes and pulling the strings of both the church and global politics, with Pope Francis being the first Jesuit Pope in history. These theories have gained new traction. Could there be a deeper connection between Pope Francis's Jesuit background, the role of the Black Pope, and the Antichrist prophecy? Conspiracy theorists suggest that the Jesuits, under the guidance of the Black Pope, have long had a hidden agenda on that involves manipulating global events to bring about the end times. They claim that this secretive order operates as a kind of shadow Vatican, using the visible Pope as a figurehead while controlling the Church's true operations from behind closed doors. With Pope Francis, a Jesuit himself, sitting in the highest position of power, some believe that the prophecy has finally come full circle. But how credible are these claims? To understand this, we must first explore the role of the Jesuits and their history within the Church. Founded in the 16th century by Ignatius of Loyola, the Jesuits were initially formed to defend the Church against the Protestant Reformation. Over time, they became known for their intellectual rigor, missionary work, and their ability to adapt to different cultures in spreading Catholicism. While the Jesuits have a long and respected history, their secretive nature and immense influence have always made them a target for suspicion and conspiracy. Adding to the intrigue, the current Black Pope, Arturo Sorza, has spoken out in favor of Pope Francis's progressive vision for the Church, creating even more fuel for conspiracy theories does the close relationship between Pope Francis and the Black Pope indicate a deeper, more sinister collaboration? Or is this simply a modern reimagining of ancient fears about power and corruption within the Church? The truth is, the idea of the Black Pope being the puppet master behind the scenes is likely exaggerated. The Jesuits, while powerful, are not some shadowy organization plotting world domination. However, the symbolism behind the Black Pope and his mysterious influence is hard to ignore. When combined with Pope Francis's Jesuit background, it provides fertile ground for those seeking to connect dots between the papacy, the Antichrist, and the end times. So, could the Black Pope be the real force behind Pope Francis's supposed role as the Antichrist? Or is this yet another myth that has spiraled out of control, blending history, religion, and conspiracy into an elaborate narrative. As with many aspects of this theory, the answer is far from clear. However, one thing is certain. The story of the Black Pope adds yet another layer of intrigue to the already complex relationship between the current social situation, Pope Francis's revelations, and the prophecies of the Antichrist. In a recent statement that has rocked the common faith of believers worldwide, Pope Francis has offered a new perspective, one that radically departs from the traditional understanding of this apocalyptic figure. According to Pope Francis, the Antichrist is not necessarily a single person who will rise to power in the end times. Rather, he suggests that the Antichrist might be something far more pervasive and insidious a cultural system or a set of values that seeks to undermine the teachings of Christ from within. In his address, Pope Francis argued that the Antichrist manifests through ideologies that promote selfishness, division, and materialism. He pointed out that these values are increasingly prevalent in modern society, particularly in Western culture, where individualism and consumerism reign supreme. The Pope warned that when people prioritize wealth, power, and personal gain over love, compassion, 
and service to others, they are, in effect, serving the Antichrist without even realizing it. But perhaps the most startling aspect of his revelation was his assertion that the Antichrist is already here, actively at work in the world. According to Pope Francis, the signs are all around us in the increasing secularization of society, the breakdown of family values, and the growing influence of ideologies that seek to erase God from the public sphere. He emphasized that the Antichrist is not just a future threat, but a present reality, one that Christians must recognize and resist in their daily lives. It states, children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. This shift from focusing on a single apocalyptic figure to a broader societal manifestation of evil has profound theological implications. It suggests that the Antichrist is not necessarily a future event to be feared, but an ongoing spiritual battle that Christians must confront every day. In light of Pope Francis's shocking revelation about the Antichrist, one must ask, does the current chaos of our social situation for the jest that the time has come? Is this not the clearest sign that the Antichrist is upon us? Over the last two centuries, we have witnessed a troubling increase in new inventions, wars, diseases, earthquakes, and astronomical phenomena all potentially pointing to the imminent appearance of this sinister figure. Some even argue that we inhabit a world fundamentally structured around anti-Christian principles. This extends beyond political systems, which undoubtedly serve the devil's agenda. It encompasses the hearts of individuals, each of us descendants of the fallen first couple, making us, in essence, children of the devil. Since 312 AD, the church has seen a troubling lineage of corrupt men occupying gilded thrones, adorned in splendid white robes and crowned with ostentatious glory. These figures, masquerading as God's mouthpieces, are often venerated to the point of blasphemy by a godless populace. The world could not embody the Antichrist spirit more than it does now. Indeed, the stage has been set for the Antichrist for quite some time. As we observe the current geopolitical turmoil in the Middle East, one cannot help but sense the devil's anxiety about fulfilling his role in the unfolding prophecies. He seems intent on hiding his key player, perhaps hoping to deviate from the divine blueprint laid out in scripture. This is evident in the push for Israel to accept a one-sided peace agreement that favors Muslims, effectively stalling the necessary conditions for the Jewish temple reconstruction an essential component for the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies. This ultimate fulfillment is something the devil desperately wishes to avoid, as it foretells his eventual defeat. The Antichrist, when he comes, will be a master deceiver, a liar, and a purveyor of sin, seeking to corrupt souls, especially in their moments of weariness and despair. Scripture warns us to fear not those who can destroy the body, but rather him who can cast both body and soul into hell. The Bible itself reveals that the Antichrist is already present and has been since the time of the Apostle John, approximately two millennia ago. Furthermore, it teaches that there is not just one Antichrist, but many. As we read in the scriptures, children, it is the last hour, and just as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now any Antichrists have appeared. This is how we know it is the last hour. This is exactly what the Bible says about the Antichrist. The letters of John, while they do reference the Antichrist at various points, also make it abundantly clear that there are many such individuals. As John tells us, many Antichrists have already come. Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is of the Antichrist. Anyone who denies that Jesus came in the flesh embodies the spirit of the Antichrist. Moreover, the eschatological framework in these passages is not a distant hope, but a present reality. The author speaks as if he and his readers are already living in the last days, stating, it is the last hour. This may seem to imply an expectation that Jesus would return during their lifetime a misunderstanding, perhaps, but it resonates with the themes of the Gospel of John, which speaks of eternal life beginning now. Rather than being a future promise, this perspective aligns with Peter's proclamation on Pentecost, 
where he references Joel 2's vision of the last days as being fulfilled in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Likewise, Paul's assertion that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation supports this idea of living in the age to come. It's important to understand that the writer's focus is not on speculative timelines about the end times, but rather on the call to maintain sound doctrine. The letters of John urge his audience to cling to the truth of Jesus and to express the truth through lives marked by love. Furthermore, we must recognize that the portrayal of the Antichrist differs significantly from Paul's depiction of the man of lawlessness. The only common thread between them is the theme of deception and the warning to believers against being misled by those who distort the truth of concern that transcends any specific timeline. Lastly, we find that the beast is a pivotal figure in the grand narrative of the book of Revelation. In Revelation 13 to 1 to 18, the beast from the sea emerges as part of an evil trinity, alongside the dragon Satan and the beast from the earth, who is later identified as the false prophet. It's crucial to note that this beast is not equated with either Paul's man of lawlessness or John's antichrist. Indeed, these specific terms are absent from Revelation itself. Back to the question at the beginning here's a clue. Take a look at 2 Thessalonians due to 9.10 and see if you can figure it